Ahana wa salam, shalom. Hello from the middle of Jerusalem. This is Al Shak Al Asatlana, our Middle East, with Khalid Abu Tuame and myself, Dan Diker. We are here to turn the Middle East inside out and give you the behind the scenes view. And today, kidnapping defeat from the jaws of victory. Israel, jihad, Gaza, and fighting Hamas with over 100 hostages in captivity. Join us. Pilot, here we are. Kay just came back from the United States, a 12-day trip, uh, uh, a very, very disturbed and frightened U.S. audiences. We spoke in Florida. We spoke in New York. Uh, people are very concerned about the outbreak and the, um, I would say, the tidal wave of violence, anti-Semitism rolling along in America's major cities. You're absolutely right. I mean, we met hundreds of people, and what we heard from them was that we are very worried about anti-Semitism in general and about what's happening on the campuses, which is also connected to anti-Semitism, the anti-Israel campaigns on the campuses. And, uh, you know, they raised it with us wherever we went. They're trying to find out where, where, where does it come from. And what we told them is very important. Where were you all these years? This is, you're paying the price uh, of your silence or uh, of not paying enough attention, let's say, to all these anti-Israel campaigns that have been taking place not only in the past few years, but since the mid-70s, as you pointed out correctly, when uh, Yasser Arafat uh, and the PLO back then tried to label Israel as a racist, apartheid, uh, genocidal country, uh, and things like that. So first of all, there's good news that, you know, American Jews are finally waking up and looking around and feeling the heat and uh, seeing what's really happening, uh, seeing the threat of anti-Semitism and seeing that these dangerous campaigns on the campuses are not only against Israel, but against Jews. Oh, that's a very important yeah. point, Hal. You made this point that surprised a lot of people. You said, listen, folks, this is a jihad. And people look to you and say, what? It's a jihad? Like that word is generally not associated with the West uh, generally or the United States specifically. And they said to you, what do you mean it's a jihad? And you said, yes, look at the statements by some of the Hamas leaders. Look at the statements by ISIS leaders. In fact, the Hamas leaders were actually saying, those that had been captured and interviewed by Israel, they're saying, yeah, we were, we, we were more than ISIS. What we did was beyond what ISIS did. Hamas, Houthis, Hezbollah, uh, the Shia in Iraq, the Shia groups uh, that are now attacking Israel, and certain Iranian-backed groups in Syria are openly talking about a jihad. They're not saying, hey, this is a territorial dispute. They're not saying, hey, we want to liberate uh, uh, this settlement or that settlement or this city or this. They're, they're saying this is a jihad against Jews. It's against Israel. It's against Jews worldwide. And this will, it's only a matter of time before this spills over uh, into the U.S. Uh, and into Western capitals, and they will also feel the heat over there. So how do we know that this is jihad? All we have to do is just listen to what the, the, the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad and all of Iran's proxies are saying openly that our ultimate goal is the elimination of Israel, period. And the elimination of Israel, and ultimately, as Hamas leaders have said, the elimination of Western society. They talked about invading Rome. They talk about, you know, uh, uh, what they called Consta Constant Constantinople. They talk about, uh, you know, the Crusader Zionist Alliance. Remember Osama bin Laden right after 9 11? And people were not paying attention to what that means. They said, oh, it's Israel again. Oh, it's a territorial conflict again. Not the case. Well, I mean, I, I, re I again refer you to the uh, Hamas charter, the 1988 original charter, and not the... Not the 2016 uh, fake charter, the uh, fake uh, 2000, 2017, version. 2017. According to some Western media outlets, uh, this is a true 
uh, or this is the updated uh, charter. And even Hamas is saying, no, it's not an updated charter. It was just a political document published in 2017, apparently to appease some Arab countries or some people in America. I, I don't want to go into that right now. But if you go to the original charter, which has never been changed, by the way, it talks about Islam welcoming Christians and Jews to live under its wing. And the sentence says it all. This is what it's really about. And they say, this is a jihad. Look at look at how many, wor- how many times the word jihad is mentioned in the Hamas charter. Look how many times the word jihad, holy war, is mentioned in the statements of Ismail Haniya, Khalid Mash'al, the uh, armed wing of Hamas, Azzeddin al-Qassam, and all the other groups. They are openly talking about a jihad. When will people in the West wake up and realize that this is a jihad against Jews, against Israel, and against the friends of the Jews and the friends of Israel and anyone who is associated with them? which means the U.S., Europe, and Western civilization. This is really, uh, as you said, a wake-up call, but it's also a learning curve. I remember, just as an historical point of reference, Khalid, back in 2001, it was, it was uh, late September, just a couple of weeks after 9-11, and you know, the smoke was still billowing, uh, billowing from the, uh, the remains of the World Trade Center in New York. And I was a newsman at that time with Channel One English News, IBA, and I interviewed um, an ambassador to France, the French ambassador, sorry, the French ambassador to Israel by the name of Jacques Hunsinger. And, and right after 9-11, I said to him, uh, Amb- Mr. Ambassador, how would you understand uh, the Al-Qaeda and, and uh, Hamas as uh, you know two uh, birds of a feather? And uh, as a matter of fact, there, there had been uh, in the in the second, what they call the Al Aqsa Intifada, uh, here there had been a Hamas suicide bombing, and he said, "Oh no no no, the Hamas and uh, Al Qaeda are two very different organizations. Al Qaeda is Salafi Jihad, is where Jihad, as you just said, now Halid, no, but Hamas, that's a political conflict. And there you have, I've never forgotten that moment. And and goodness gracious, we're in 2023, is 22 years ago. But this is this is an illustration that's never." Uh, abandoned me about what you're saying now. It doesn't surprise me because I've heard it from uh, many of my Western colleagues. I've heard it from so-called scholars in the West where they used to argue that Hamas is different than ISIS, Hamas is different than Al-Qaeda. And when I used to ask them why, they came up with all kinds of uh, uh, excuses or all kinds of justifications that just don't match the reality. There is no real difference between the the ideologies of these three groups and other groups associated with radical Islam, they all seek to establish an Islamic caliphate, to restore the Islamic caliphate, to spread Islam uh, willingly and even by force to the rest of the world. This is their declared goal. You know, it's not that you have to be a scholar to understand it. This is what they are saying very openly. How does jihad uh, as a war strategy, a global war ideology, relate to hostages uh, and, um, you know, the the victims, now the civilian victims, the hostages that are now languishing, if you will, in terrible, unthinkable conditions in in Hamas uh, tunnels and homes and... uh, how does that affect uh, the, the whole the taking of hostages? Does it does it justify the taking of children and and women and elderly? Yes, I'll tell you why. In this case, in this particular case of Israeli Jews, what justifies it is that first of all you have to demonize them, you have to delegitimize them, you have to depict these Jews, whether they're children, women, the elderly, as a colonialist as settler, extremist settlers, quote unquote, as thugs, as a group of people that does not belong here. And then jihad applies to them. This is what you do. These are infidels. These are usurpers of the land. These are non-Muslims occupying Muslim land. 
And this is where jihad applies to them. And that's why the kidnapping itself is part of the jihad. You're kidnapped. You're not kidnapping Muslims, although they did, by the way, mm, you. They did. Uh, but in this case, you're kidnapping people who have been de demonized, uh, people who have been delegitimized, people who have been depicted as aggressors, as strangers, foreigners to the land. So they've been in a way dehumanized. There's exactly. No exactly. And that's what justifies, in their eyes, the whole concept of jihad. Mm -hmm. Now, so here we have a very serious situation of 130, some 130 hostages, including uh, 19 women, still 19 women. There's some children and toddlers, elderly. Um, how, I, I know that the Emir of Qatar spoke uh, last night with uh, with the, uh, President Biden. It's probably the 10th uh, phone conversation between the two in, in the past 82 days. And in, in, in the past 82 days, you and I have had this conversation that goes something like this. How could it be that the president of the free world, who has a lot of leverage, it appears, on the Qataris, major uh, military installations in Qatar, doesn't have the type of leverage to say to him, listen, tell the Hamas that they've got 24 hours to come up uh, with, to, exp to free all the hostage, otherwise, uh, or end up, uh, uh, you know, and, and you better deport the Hamas people. Otherwise, we're going to end our relationship with you. We're going to pull out our military and, and worse. Well, uh, apparently the U.S. president is not employing enough pressure. Uh, it, he's not setting a, a deadline. I mean, you know, the, you could also ask the same question in another way. How come an Arab dictator who is hosting the leaders of Hamas does not have the power or the leverage to, uh, you know, to influence them. Do you want to tell me that the Emir of Qatar cannot summon to his office uh, Ismail Haniya, Khalid Mash'al, and the rest of the Hamas leaders and tell them, folks, listen, if you don't release all the hostages within 24 hours, you're out of Qatar. What's so hard about that? Good question. Maybe the Emir of Qatar does not really feel that there is enough pressure on him. Uh, there is a way of approaching these, uh, you know, Arab dictators. If you're going to be nice to them and polite and talk to them, and yeah, they won't uh, move. They won't move. But if you tell them, uh, listen, if you don't do it, I'm going to cut off my diplomatic ties with you. I will uh, remove uh, U.S. aid uh, or st uh, suspend U.S. aid to Qatar, or I will close down the U.S. military uh, base in Qatar, then, you know, the Qataris will think twice. But there is a feeling that there isn't enough pressure on the Arab leaders. Do you really want to tell me that President Sisi, who invited Ismail Haniya two weeks ago to Cairo, but, or last week to Cairo, he can't call, bring Ismail Haniya and tell him, listen, 48 hours, I want this to end. Uh, if you really want to spare the lives of people in Gaza, release the hostages now. Uh, but the feeling again is that, you know, the Arab leaders are not really involved in this. They're not employing enough pressure on Hamas. The feeling is that Hamas is not under enough pressure. And yeah. that's why they're not going to, uh, you know, to release uh, any prisoner. Ironically, how or any hostage, sorry. Absolutely. And ironically, the Egyptians have outlawed the Muslim Brotherhood which means that Hamas, by extension, which is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, is, is, is outlawed in Egypt. And, and by, e, by President al-Sisi, who's a military man and, uh, you know, a serious, been a serious president, he looks weak in the eyes of Hamas. I mean, the Arab leaders look weak in the eyes of Hamas. And I, it was suggested to me yesterday by Rami Igra, who is a mo former Mossad division head of the uh, hostages and disappeared persons, that today... Uh, Yahya Sinwar is is seen on the Arab street as the strongest jihadi uh, Salafi uh, person, in j person of this generation. I totally agree with you, and I follow what's happening on the Arab social media websites. I see what's happening uh, on the Arab street. Uh, and again, you know, Yahya Sinwar is being glorified as a hero, as uh, someone... Uh, as a great Arab Muslim warrior who managed to surprise Israel, who managed to humiliate Israel, who uh, carried out his threat to launch a jihad against Israel. 
who is inflicting heavy pain on Israel, who whose forces are killing Israelis every day. And that's why it's very important for the Arab leaders, if they want to save them, their regimes also, to stand up against Hamas. But if you don't, then you are actually, uh, uh, you know, an accomplice in this. You are actually uh, allowing the Arab street to continue with its, sub with its support for Hamas and for the Hamas leaders, and it will finally come back to you, the Arab dictator. Uh, we're told a lot that, oh, Arab dictators uh, are opposed, or the Arab leaders are opposed to what Hamas did. Uh, they condemn it. But where, where are their voices? How come they're not speaking out? Uh, they need to speak out. Can you imagine if Hamas had attacked one of these Arab countries? Yeah, they would have flattened the whole they would Gaza Strip in half an hour. Can you imagine what would have happened if Hamas had kidnapped uh, 200 Muslim Muslims? What would have happened in your view? You know, uh, I mean, look what happens in Syria. Look what happens in Yemen. Look what happened uh, in Iraq. Uh, the, the response would have been 10 times you know, stronger than Israel's current response uh, to what happened. Uh, and that's why the hostages are not coming back because the feeling is that there isn't enough pressure. I'm not talking about military pressure on Hamas. I think military pressure on Hamas in Gaza is, uh, is great. It's big. It's huge. But what about the, the pressure on the political leaders? You don't feel that there is no, any, any no. kind of pressure not coming from uh, the Arab Not Saudi presidents. Arabia, not Saudi Arabia. Not even from the Arab media. You hardly see. Why, why do you think that is? You think they're afraid? Because they're afraid of the Arab masses. You see, Hamas is now very popular in the Arab world, and Hamas are heroes, and Hamas are, you know, they liberated or they managed to infiltrate Israel. They humiliated Israel, as I mentioned. And that's why the Arab leaders are always afraid of the Arab street. Arab leaders are also responsible for the fact that the Arab street has been radicalized against Israel. Why? Because Arab leaders incite their people against Israel almost on a daily basis. Mm. And, it, you know, it's a vicious cycle. You incite your people against Israel to a point where you can no longer even say a good word about Israel. We're seeing that also in the West. Uh, and during our trip there, we saw more and more uh, evidence that on the social networks, as well as in some of the neighborhoods, even in the middle of the Upper West Side of Manhattan, People are accusing us, the Jews, of lying about October 7th, of making up the massacres, of, uh, you know, of, of completely fabricating the rapes. And that itself became its own anti-Semitic trope. But that was really a shock that the whole legitimacy of I, not only eyewitness accounts, but Hamas GoPro cameras were the ones documenting it. And they they were... Uh, they were accusing the Jews of creating a whole conspiracy uh, around the around the atrocities of October 7th. You're absolutely right. And I see this also on social media. And I'm not referring only to Arab social media networks, by the way, and accounts. You see that it's infiltrating into uh, almost mainstream uh, media in the West. I talk to many of my Western colleagues, by the way, and I can tell you that some of them Ask me quietly, uh, are you sure, Khalid, there were, there were, you know, massacres? Are you sure there were rapes? Are you sure that, uh, you know... Babies were beheaded. Babies, yeah. And when you tell them, well, yes, you know, we there's evidence, they think, oh, come on, you know, do you really believe that? So, we, I mean, we, we have moved from the stage of uh, trying to underestimate what happened what happened on October 7th completely denying it mm. and even putting the blame on Israel yeah that's very very serious because it, it not only is not just a denial but it really is a further delegitimization of of, of the of the victim it's actually absolutely it's actually part of the massive campaign to delegitimize Israel demonize Jews and this is what is promoting anti-semitism First of all, you you accuse the victims. Uh, then you know you uh, you you say that the victims are or the, those who support the victims uh, are actually making things up. It's 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 actually crazy. It's insane that this is happening. Yeah, it, it's insane. It's scary because the the literature has this type of 
uh, has the, these types of strategies. I know that. Uh, and note that you hardly see anyone questioning Hamas's uh, right, ver that's right. versions or the PLO versions, or it's usually Israel that is called into, yeah. you know. They've been, you see this in the mainstream media, Khaled, as a media man, you know this. They're accepting the Hamas Gaza Ministry of Health numbers as, uh, as God's word. Well, you see, for example, that some media outlets in the U.S., mainstream media outlets, whenever or each time that Israel carries out some kind of a controversial attack uh, or operation, that these media outlets launch their own investigations yeah. into these events. Uh, wh when was the last time you saw them launch an investigation against Hamas atrocities in Gaza? When was the last time you saw these media outlets launch uh, an investigation against PLO corruption? Why is Israel being singled out? Good question. I mean, I don't know what beyond anti-Semitism what to say. I mean, there's the victim victor, there's the oppressed there's the oppressed oppressor, the weak strong. That's how I can understand that the the media the, in, in the Western discourse anyway likes to frame things in terms of who's weak and who, who's the, the the weak guy is always right, the strong guy is always wrong. Yep. Yeah. Unfortunately, that that is the case. Yeah. So let us go back to the hostages for a second. Yeah, it it if you had asked me 82 days ago whether in 80 days the hostages will will still be there, I said I doubt it. I I would I would have bet that they would have been returned. But here you have this long slog in Gaza because of the biggest underground terror tunnel network in the world. There's no larger terror metro in the world. Billions and billions of European, American, and Israeli tax dollars went to the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority transferred it to Gaza, to the Palestinian Authority uh, um, employees in Gaza, and the Hamas, of course, is in control. I mean, I think there are two reasons why the hostages haven't been released so far. One is the slow pace of the Israeli military operation. With all, don't forget also that the operation started uh, nearly 10 days after the kidnapping. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Hamas had a lot of time to uh, move them around, to hide them in... Uh, in tunnels and apartments. So that's number one, the slow pace of the uh, Israeli military operation. And number two, as I mentioned earlier, the lack or absence of Arab Western pressure on Hamas le leaders, and I'm referring to the Hamas leadership in Qatar and in Beirut and in Turkey. These are the two main reasons why the hostages have not been released. So in other words, the, pre the the pressure points can also come upon Turkey, upon President Erdogan, who, by the way, just called Netanyahu Hitler. And here is a NATO, he's a NATO member. Like, these things just are not making sense, right? You know, we saw the Arab uh, leaders hold a summit a few weeks ago. And instead of, you know, putting pressure on Hamas to release the hostages and end the conflict and end the suffering of the Palestinians in Gaza, they came out with statements condemning Israel. That doesn't help the Palestinians. According to Hamas, more than 20,000 Palestinians have been killed so far. And many, people, many Palestinians, by the way, are beginning to question the, uh, the price. They're saying, I mean, what's going on over here? Why, why are we still holding, why is Hamas still holding 120 Israelis? Uh, is it really worth the price? I mean, 20, more than 20,000 people killed in, in Gaza, according to Hamas. Uh, so you, you see, the, you know, people beginning to ask questions. Yeah, you see also a lot of the humanitarian aid that Israel has agreed to ship into Gaza is right away pilfered by the Hamas operatives and, and taken into the tunnels for the Hamas and to other places of storage. And Hamas does not care about the Palestinians. Hamas cares about Hamas. Mm -hmm. Hamas is fighting for its survival. Ham the name of the game now is... How will Hamas remain in power? How will Yahya Sinwar, Muhammad Dif, and Marwan Isa continue to lead Hamas in Gaza? That's all what Hamas cares. How do, you, how do you see that unfolding now? I mean, the, the assessments are that Sinwar is in a tunnel. He's got a very sophisticated personal tunnel escape route. How do you see Sinwar as staying, remaining relevant? Look, as long as, you know, uh, or I would say something like this. It all depends on how the Israeli military operation uh, develops and continues. Whether if it, if you step up the pressure, uh, then, you know, they will either have to surrender or die.
uh, I don't see this continuing or lasting forever. That's why everything depends on what the IDF does in Gaza right now. But I can tell you my personal opinion. Yeah. As someone who knows these people very well, they're not going to surrender. No. If you think that Yahya Sinwar is going to come out of his uh, tunnel with his hands raised in, in his underwear, that's not going to happen. These people would prefer to die than to be, uh, than to go down into history as the uh, people who surrendered as cowards. Mm. So it's either they will die or they will be captured by Israel. There's no, I don't see a third, uh, uh, a, a third option. They're saying we want to become martyrs. Are there? Do you see Israel using any Arabic language um, disinformation or information operations? loudspeakers, leaflets, um, any other kinds of communication vehicles to explain to the uh, Gazans what they actually did and why Israel's there and, uh, you know, to try to get them onto Israel's side? Well, the IDF has an uh, Arabic uh, spokesman, Arabic language spokesman, yeah. Abichai Adering. He addresses, he talks to the Palestinian uh, public in Gaza directly. You also have communication between Koga, the coordinator of government activities. Uh, uh, you know, they have a good website and they also address the Palestinians. And don't forget that many Palestinians, even in Gaza, by the way, are on social media and they are exposed also to, not only to the Hamas uh, narrative, but they also hear the other side. The, the problem in Gaza is that people are still afraid. They're still afraid of standing up, to, uh, standing up against Hamas because they don't know. They, they're still not sure that Hamas is going to be destroyed. The, some of them fear that after the war, you will still have Hamas over there. So people are being very careful. That's a, it's really uh, an extraordinary insight into the Arab political culture. It's so different, uh, very, very different from the West. Since we're talking about insights, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, someone who spends 90% of his time following Palestinian uh, websites and uh, listening to what Hamas is saying and hearing Arab uh, military analysts, uh, you know, you get the impression that Israel has been defeated. You get the impression that tens of thousands of Israeli soldiers have been killed. That's because Sinwar is saying it. It's not only Sinwar. It's not only Sinwar. You get the impression that hundreds of Israeli tanks have been destroyed. And, you know, we're talking about a different world, uh, uh, Dan. And this is the, you know, you look at it and you don't know whether to laugh or to cry, but it's tragic because people are paying with their lives. Many people are being killed every day. Uh, they are selling illusions to the people yeah. that we're defeating the Israeli army and it's only a matter of time. And if you just be a bit more patient, we will also destroy Israel and look at the Israeli army retreating. I mean, there are so many stories you see over there, misinformation, disinformation, fake news that is giving the people in the Arab world, the false impression that Israel is much weaker than you thought, that Israel is, act, that the Israeli army is actually losing every day, dozens, if not hundreds of soldiers, and that, you know, it's a, it's a different world. Do, do you think uh, that in the day after, we, I think, have to have a dedicated show to the day after to talk about what the options are? Because as we discussed at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs today, and we've discussed before, the idea of having what President Biden calls a revitalized, re-energized Palestinian authority, you say that to people in the Palestinian areas, they just laugh at you. Yeah, the same way as I smile. Uh, look, uh, listen very carefully to what the Palestinian Authority is saying and what Hamas is saying. They're saying, without our blessing, there will be no administration in Gaza. Now, this is not only... A statement this is a threat a warning to any Palestinian who will dare come to rule Gaza through the Americans and through the Israelis if the Americans really want to help create you know a better administration in Gaza they need to make sure at least that the Palestinian Authority does not stand in its way the Palestinian Authority's main goal right now is to foil any attempt by the Americans to create an alternative leadership or to bypass President Mahmoud Abbas, as they are saying. Uh. A few days ago, Abbas Abu Mazen convened an urgent emergency meeting of the PLO Executive Committee in Ramallah following reports that the Americans are trying to replace him, the Americans are 
trying to sideline him. The Americans are trying to find uh, or establish a technocratic government, which means a government of independent figures in Gaza. And what was the statement that came out of that meeting? A PLO is the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. We won't allow anyone else to tamper with this reality. In other words, you won't be able to do anything without my blessing. Mm -hmm. So if you really want that to, uh, if you want the plan uh, to rule Gaza in the post-war era, you need to make sure that there are no threats. But th there are, the threats are coming already. They're coming already, and uh, we're going to have to take a hard look at them because it really requires a deep, deep, uh, say, deep dive into post-war Gaza. Very complicated. Israel doesn't want to deal with it right now. We, the Jerusalem Center, actually have a draft plan. It, uh, it is uh, much more sensitive to the way the Middle East is set up. Americans are absolutely convinced that the Palestinian Authority, who, by the way, can't even uh, uh, govern their own spaces in Gaza, in uh, the in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, are going to come back and govern the Gazans, uh, who actually threw them out back in 2007. Not only threw them out, they threw them off roofs. And if they go back under the current circumstances, the Gazans will eat them for breakfast. Eat because it's following Israel. Uh, that's one reason. The other reason, the corruption, and Abu Mazen. Corruption, and they will also tell them, where were you? Now, you know, what did you do in the West Bank? Did you send, where are the Palestinian security forces? And why are you conducting security coordination with Israel? Countless, endless uh, complaints to, the, to a point where I think the Palestinian Authority would rather stay, maintain the status quo. Yeah, they, they don't even want to come. As a matter of fact, that's why Mahmoud Abbas canceled his participation in the Jordan. There was an Amman conference on uh, the future of the Middle East that they canceled. They didn't want to be put in that position of having to say, sure, we'll come back and uh, govern Gaza. Well, you and I are going to have to continue talking about this. Khaled Abu Tawabe, my, my colleague, friend, and guest host here on Al Shakal Al Satlana, our Middle East. That was a very compelling uh, discussion about state of play in uh, jihadi run Gaza Strip, Israel, hostages and a very, very complex uh, state of affairs. So thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Khaled. Look forward to having our next conversation next week. Thank you.